All right, let's get started. How was the exam? Easy? Too easy. Who said it was, hands up if it was easy for you? Okay. So, so. All right. You know, I sent the uh, Scantrons in to get processed this morning. It, it may take a little bit of time. Sometimes I get them back really quickly. I may get the results back this afternoon, but more realistic, probably next Monday. So you should be able to see your exam score on web assign early next week. That's my expectation. Okay, yeah. Monday, Tuesday, that kind of thing. So, so these things come back, and then your TA has to enter the scores into the grade books one by one. So, you know. Monday, Tuesday kind of thing. Okay, so today we're going to um, do a little bit of review on trig. So we'll be looking at, in the textbook, this is the appendix D and parts of section 1.5. Next Monday we'll look at the derivative of trig functions, but before that, let's just do a one day review on trig. Okay, so everything is based on measuring an angle. Usually we use theta, right? And there are many different ways to measure. The most common ones that we use are degrees and radians. There are other ways to measure degrees, but the, mo the, the ones that we use most in science and engineering are degrees and radians. There's something called a gradient. That's kind of a weird way to measure things. But you can look them up if you, if you want. But the only two that we really need, need to know are degrees and radians. We know there are 360 degrees in a circle. And for a whole circle, there are 2 pi radians. Okay, so measuring things in 360 degree, that's rooted in ancient history, ancient Babylonians, ancient Greeks, ancient Indians. Also, they all mentioned about dividing a circle into 360 units. Radians is a little bit different. Okay, does anyone know what a radian is? What is the definition of a radian? That's right, yeah, very good. So this is exactly it. A radian is the angle such that the arc length, the circular arc length right here, is the angle such that the angle such that the circular length is equal to the radius of the circle. That's the definition of one radian. The angle such that this little green arc circular um, segment is equal to the, the radius. Okay. So we want this. Anyone know the formula for a circular arc length? Who remembers? Right, so S is equal to the radius of the circle times the angle, the included angle. Okay, so when the angle is exactly such that this S is equal to the one radius, then that angle is called one radian. We're all pretty familiar with how we convert between these two. 
You want to go from degree to radians. What do you do? Right, so if I have 60 degrees, how do I convert that to the equivalent radians? What do I do? Multiply by 180 over pi. I'm sorry, pi over 180, I said it backwards, right? If I have 360 degrees, I know I should get two pi radians, right? So I take my 360, multiply by pi over 180, that's my two pi. So you take whatever degrees in degrees you got, multiply by pi over 180 to get equivalent in um, radians. By the way, we usually use RAD to denote um, radians. Radians to degree, you multiply by the reciprocal of that. And by the way, in calculus, a lot of the formulas that you will see next week with the derivatives of trig functions, they only work if we measure things in radians. So in calculus, unless otherwise noted, You want to measure all angles in radians. All the derivative formulas you'll see on Monday and all the, sub, all the consequences of those things, they're only valid if we're measuring things in radians. They don't work if we measure things in degrees. So once again, unless otherwise noted, assume everything is in radians. We all know the basic, the six basic trig functions, right? These are sine, cosine, tangent, they are reciprocals, cosecant, secant, and cotangent. These are the six that we use today. There are actually a whole lot more than these six that we no longer really use. There's something called a haver sign that was used back in the days when people navigated over the ocean using the stars and all these things to navigate. Today we have GPS, we don't use that anymore, but you can still look up the formula, what's called the haver sign formula that can help people navigate um, in the oceans. And I'm sure we all know the definitions of these. Here's my angle, here's my right angle. This is the opposite side. This is the adjacent side. And the longest is the hypotenuse. Sine is what? Opposite over hypotenuse, right? Cosine, what's cosine? Over hypotenuse. Tangent is the opposite over adjacent which is also equal to sine over cosine, right? If you know these three, which I'm sure we all do, then the other three are just reciprocals of these. 
a cosecant. CSC of theta is 1 over sine of theta, which, by the way, is not the same as the inverse sine. Okay? Um, so that would be hyper hypotenuse over the opposite. Secant of theta is 1 over cosine. That thing upside down. Cotangent is 1 over tangent. That thing upside down. And it is also equal to cosine over sine, of course. All right, so this is something that we already know. You, want, <clears throat> you need to know the, the values of at least sine and cosine. If you know sine and cosine, everything else is a consequence of those two things. For these so-called special angles, pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3, pi over 2, and so on. Equivalent to those in degrees would be 30, 45, 60, 90, 120, 135, 150, 180, so on and so on and so on. Many of you probably have memorized the unit circle, or I'll show you an, an alternative to memorizing that whole unit circle. An alternative is to remember two special triangles. The first one is right angle and 2 pi over 4, 45 degrees. The sum of the angles in a triangle is 180. We know that. Now, if you had this triangle here, the sides are radical 2, 1, and 1. The other one Thirty, sixty, ninety. The longest side is two. This one has a shorter side, one, and pi over three gets a side radical three. And you can check that by the Pythagorean theorem. We know the sum of these two, sum of the square of these two should be equal to the square of that. So square of this is three, square of that is one, sum is four, is two squared. Same thing here. Okay, so if you have these two triangles available, then if you're looking for, say, for example, tangent of 225 degrees, all you got to do is to, rem to locate that angle and somehow squeeze one of these into that picture. Okay, 225, this is 90, 180, 270. 225 is halfway between 180 and 270. So it's right here. 
then you take the, the side the, the side right here, move it to the closed x-axis to make a triangle. This is obviously 90 degrees. This is 180. So this little angle right here is 45. That means this little one right here is also 45. Okay, then I look at this, these two here. I'm, I'm clearly dealing with this one here. And I'm looking at this one, kind of rotate it a little bit. The hypotenuse is radical 2. That's the green side right here. The other sides are 1 and 1. But I need to make these two both negative. Why is that? Yeah, if you look at the x and y axis here, we're moving into the x region right here. Right? So this, even though the length is 1, we want to make it a negative 1 when we look at the location of this. <coughs> location of this terminal point right here. How would you locate this point? It would go to minus 1, comma, minus 1. So you would make them negative because we're in the third quadrant with x and y both being negative. Okay. Okay, then you focus on this angle right here. That 45 degree. You don't look at the whole thing. You look at inside the triangle, looking at this angle right here, the one that's formed with the x-axis. Tangent, we know, is the opposite over adjacent. Opposite to this one is minus 1. Adjacent to this angle is minus 1. So there's my positive 1 for tangent of 245. All right, so basically any angle, as long as you can figure out where it is, draw a triangle to the nearest x-axis, and then squeeze one of these. And whenever it goes into the negative and x and y region, make sure you make the sides negative appropriately. The hypotenuse is never negative, never. Okay, how many of you have memorized the unit circle? Okay, how many of you find these values by doing something similar to what I did here? Okay. Choose whatever is comfortable for you. Make sure you know, for example, the tangent of 3 pi over 4, 5 pi over 4, that kind of thing. We occasionally will need those values. Okay, another quick review of the positive functions in each quadrant. This is quadrant one, quadrant two, quadrant Three, quadrant four. In quadrant one, which of the six trig functions are positive? All of them, right. Every single one of them. Quadrant two, what's positive? Sine, good. And what? And the, in, and the reciprocal of sine, right? So sine and cosecant, right. But again, if you know sine, just knowing that the fact that cosecant is the reciprocal of sine, you automatically know that's going to be negative, uh, positive, sorry. Third quadrant, what's, what's positive? Tangent. And of course, cotangent. Last one, fourth quadrant. Cosine, right? 
cosine and the reciprocal secant. Okay. Everything's positive. Sine is positive. Tangent, cosine. When you go to Calc 3, you started looking at three-dimensional and higher-dimensional stuff. So if you look at a three-dimensional x, y, z axis, you have more than just four quadrants. There are actually eight little, little sections. They're called octant. So in Calc 3, you talk about the first octant, the second octant, and so on. There are eight of them. And as the dimensions go up, you get more and more of these things. Uh, but they're all based on, on, the, on the simple stuff that you already know. Okay, let's talk a little bit about inverse trig functions. These things can get kind of annoying sometimes. And we're just going to focus on the basic three, inverse sine, inverse cosine, and inverse tangent. The other three, we're not going to worry about their inverses. Let's start with sine. Wow, that's a beautiful sign, isn't it? Look at that. That's, that is nice. Okay. The period is 2 pi, we know that, right? So 2 pi, pi, minus pi, minus 2 pi. Now, this thing is clearly, clearly now 1 to 1. And you remember that in order to find an inverse function, the function has to be 1 to 1. So unless it's one-to-one, -one, we can't find an inverse. But we can make it one-to-one -one by restricting the domain. The convention is to restrict the domain to minus pi over 2 inclusive to pi, pi over 2 inclusive. So we're just going to focus on the portion between here and here and ignore everything else. So if you just focus on this part right here, By the way, what's the range of sine? Right, minus 1 to positive 1, right? Okay, if you focus just on this part right here, from the red dot to the other red dot, that portion is, is 1 to 1. So ignoring everything else, noting the domain we restrict it to and the range, of course, we can find the inverse sine of that. So f inverse of the sine function can be written as sine with a minus 1 here or arc sine. Okay, so we take this portion right here, we do a reflection about the, straight, the line y is equal to x. And when you do that, the x and y coordinates will switch. 
So this point right here, this point right now is pi over 2, comma 1. That's going to get switched over to 1, comma pi over 2. And this point right here, this is currently minus pi over 2, negative 1. And that's going to get switched to minus 1, negative pi over 2. So that red dot goes over here. That red dot goes over here. Then you take that shape here to a reflection about the diagonal line, and we get something that looks like this. Okay, it's that portion right here with a mirror reflection about the line y is equal to x. The same way you deal with any tr any inverse function. And remember, the domain of the inverse will be the range of the original. The so domain would be minus 1 to 1. And its range will be the domain of the original. All right, so there's your inverse sine function. You can do exactly the same thing, like nearly the same thing, to find the inverse cosine and then the inverse tangent. So let's take a look at those two. Uh, we switch, we sketch out a cosine graph. Cosine starts at 1, goes down, it's some, the same thing that sine does, but with a phase shift. Uh, that one's not as good. Uh, oh well. All right, starts at 1, of course. The lowest it could get is minus 1. This is pi over 2. This right here is pi, and so on. And this right here would be 2 pi. Once again, clearly now 1 to 1. So we choose a portion of that and restrict the domain right there. So what we do here with inverse with cosine is we restrict the domain to go from 0 to pi. The range is the same. It doesn't matter what we restrict it to. It's still minus 1 to 1. Okay. Then you take that portion right there, ignoring everything else, and just do a um, reflection. So 0, 1 will become 1, 0. And then pi minus 1 becomes minus 1 pi. So that red dot goes over here. This red dot goes over here. 
take that shape, reflect about the y equal to x straight line, and you get something that looks kind of like, like this, kind of. Okay, its domain is the range of the original. So domain of the inverse cosine is minus 1 to 1, and the range is the domain of the original, 0 to pi. All right. Very quickly, we'll look at tangent. Again, we're not going to worry about secant, cosecant, and cotangent and their inverses too much. They're not used very often. But the inverse sine and cosine are used in, in a lot of applications. Tangent has a bunch of asymptotes. at pi over 2, negative pi over 2, and this thing repeats, right? So there's another one over here, another one over here, and so on and so on. But for the purpose of finding an inverse, we restrict the domain to just min minus pi over 2, not including by minus pi over 2, to positive pi over 2. Again, not including it. You can't. They are asymptotes. What's the range of the... the um, Tangent function, right. right? The possible y that you can get out of it, well, it goes all the way down to minus infinity. This goes all the way to, to, to positive infinity. The inverse, the arc, arc tangent of it x would turn these two vertical asymptotes into horizontal asymptotes. Pi over 2 minus pi over 2. And we'll turn this thing to a mirror reflection about the line y is equal to x. And you get this kind of shape. This guy would have the domain that's equal to the range of the original. And it would have a range that's equal to the domain of the original. And if you look at this thing here, we got horizontal asymptotes. And we know those are related to, to limits at infinity. So, for example, the limit of the inverse tangent of x as x goes to infinity is pi over 2, right? And the limit as x goes to negative infinity of the inverse tangent is negative pi over 2. When you make x progressively larger and larger negative number, your y would be closer and closer to negative pi over 2. So here's another one of, those, one of those functions that has two different asymptotes, one to the, on the right and one on the left. 
Okay, so you're going to have to pay really, really close attention to the domain and range of the inverse functions. The sine has a range that's minus pi over 2, which means a fourth quadrant angle. And pi over 2, that's a first quadrant angle. Inverse sine will never return an angle that's in the second or the third quadrant. And that has some really important consequences when you, when you work with them. For example, the inverse sine of negative radical 3 over 2. Okay, so what this is really saying is that the question this thing is asking is what angle? as sine minus 3, minus, minus radical 3 over 2. And we know there are multiple answers to that question. However, we got to make sure we pay attention to the range of the inverse function. So the question that has to be modified, what angle has a sine of minus radical 3 over 2 that's within this interval? Okay, and now, that, now there's only one answer to it. We're looking at a negative value right here, right? A negative value. So that means we must be in the fourth quadrant. Okay, let's look for an angle that's in the fourth quadrant. So this is equivalent to sine of theta equal to negative radical 3 over 2. And we know this has to occur in the fourth quadrant. Because sine is negative. Okay, so there's the angle. It has to be in the fourth for negative sine. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So opposite on the top must be negative 3, radical 3. This guy here is 2. This side must be 1 then. Okay, so what's this angle? What is this angle? Minus pi over 3. Yeah, right. Okay, look at the special triangles we looked at earlier. Where are they? The angle that's opposite to radical 3, pi over 3. But then it's moving down into the fourth quadrant from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. So that one right here is negative pi over 3. Questions?
Right. Yeah, it could be in the third quadrant, but remember the inverse sine function has a range that's only in the fourth or the first. It cannot be in the third. So you're right. If we're just looking at this question right here, it could be in the third or the fourth, but we're dealing with the inverse sine. Got to pay attention to the range. Other questions? Okay, let's look at this one. Let's look at the inverse sine of the regular sine of pi over 3. Actually, yeah, pi over 3 is fine. Okay, so how do you dissect this? Look, work with these things inside out. Let's call this stuff inside x for now. x is equal to sine of pi over 3, and sine of pi over 3 is equal to? Quick, 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 got to get those quick. What is it? Root 3 over 2, okay? Good. All right, so now this stuff inside is that. So now we're asking the question. Remember, that stuff on the inside we, t we found to be radical 3 over 2. Question is the same. What angle in the fourth quadrant or the first quadrant as sine equal to radical 3 over 2. Again, we're restricted to quadrant 4 and 1 because of the range of the inverse function. The inverse sine will never give you an angle in the second or the fourth, qu third quadrant. It has to be quadrant 4, and it has to count negative up or in the first quadrant. Okay, so what's the answer to this question? What's that? Pi over 3. Yeah, absolutely. Pi over 3. Okay, the inverse and itself and this angle gives you the angle back only if that angle you start with is in here or here. I'll write that down. But that is no longer true if the angle you started with, this theta angle, is in the second or the third quadrant. Again, a consequence of the range of the inverse sine, inverse cosine, same idea, inverse tangent, same idea. Okay, let's choose an angle in the, in the second or the third quadrant and see what happens. Let's look at inverse sine of the regular sine of 3 pi over 4. So now we're in the second quadrant. It would not give you the same angle back. And you'll see why. Why? 
And just like last time, this stuff on the inside, we'll call that x for now. And x is equal to sine of 3 pi over 4. And sine of 3 pi over 4 is? Come on, you need to know that. Sine of 3 pi over 4 is? 1 over root 2 or root 2 over 2. Okay, so the new question then is, we're looking for inverse sine of the stuff. We've, we found it to be root 2 over 2. We're looking for an angle. Because we're dealing with the inverse sine, the range can only be in the fourth or the first. So we're looking for an angle in either the fourth quadrant or the first quadrant. Whose sign is root 2 over 2? Okay, so what angle in the fourth or the... Okay, which one is it? Is it in fourth or the first? First, because of positive sine. And what angle in the first quadrant has sine equal to root 2 over 2? Pi over 4, right. Okay, so you see, if you start with an angle not in the fourth or the first quadrant, you will not get the same angle back. You'll get a coterminal angle that's in, the, um, in these two, not a coterminal, the, the similar angle in these two quadrants. Same thing goes with inverse cosine. You gotta pay close attention to the range. Okay, one more example, and then we'll end it there. Okay, sometimes you see, you see these strange combinations of trig functions and inverse trig functions. And suppose you're going to take the derivative of this later down the road. This is not a very convenient form to deal with. We can often transform these things into things that look like rational functions or polynomial functions. And those we can deal with very easily. So we handle this exactly the same way we've been doing. You work inside out. We're looking for the inverse tangent of something. That means we're, we're looking for an angle. So let's call this angle theta. If we're calling that thing theta, theta is equal to the inverse tangent of x. That is equivalent to tangent of theta equal to x. We can actually use this information right here to form a triangle. Think of this x as x over 1. And you know tangent is opposite over adjacent. So form a triangle with an angle theta that has an opposite side equal to x, adjacent side equal to 1. Opposite is x right here. Adjacent is right here, 1. Okay. And how do you find the hypotenuse? Pythagorean theorem, right? So square this plus square this, and then take the square root. So that's 1 plus x squared for the hypotenuse. All right, so now back to the original question right here. Remember, we're calling this thing theta, and that theta is this angle right here in the triangle. So the original question turns into cosine of theta. 
you have a triangle, you want to find the cosine of the angle, that is a very easy thing to do. Cosine is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So we get adjacent 1 over that. Okay, now if you're going to take the derivative of, of this function, for example, this is a rather complicated thing to deal with. This is a little bit easier to handle. We have ways to make this simpler to take the derivative. This is a bit involved, and the, the derivative is going to look pretty complicated after that. This one will look almost like itself. So that's one of the reasons you want to simplify stuff like that. Okay, that's it. Have a good weekend. See you Monday.